from any of the material we've covered so far. Okay, so last time we talked about RC circuits where you just have one resistor or a resistance and then just one capacitor and then RL where you have just one inductor and resistances. So now we're gonna move on into where we have components of RLC and so what do you do now when your circuit is a little bit more complicated? And so what do you think 
would do to, to solve this? Okay, so that's one way to know, like, at the beginning, before the switch happens, and it sat there for a long time, what is our kind of initial condition? And then you could see what happens at the very end. But it doesn't tell you necessarily what's happening in between. So with one inductor or one capacitor, it either charges up in an exponential fashion or it discharges in an exponential fashion. But what happens now when we get um, more than one component in there that is time dependent is that we can get what's called overshooting or under damping, critically damped, over damped. And so we get these forms where you also get like an oscillation that happens in between the initial and the final. And so it doesn't, it's not quite as easy. So we need to get more of a description of what is happening to the circuit. So we will have to go back to actually the, the description of, what did I tell you to guys to memorize for L, for the inductor? Yeah, uh-huh so we have um l idt is equal to the voltage correct so in this case it's going to be the voltage here vl and the current going through this inductor is going to be the same as ic is labeled there right il is equal to ic what do we know about the capacitor What's the equation I said to memorize? And that is the current going through it, I see. So with these, we can now, we know an equation for voltage across the inductor and description of the current going through the capacitor. So from here, Um, we can take a voltage loop and go around this and take a voltage loop. So we have green, deep blue. So VS, and then this is going to be the current going through it, which is IC is what I'm going to use for the current. And so that's going to be a negative. You're going to have the negative VL and then a negative VC. And so taking that loop plus VS, I'm going to close this so I can take the full loop, um, minus ICRR minus VL and minus VC. Everybody with me on the loop? Okay, so now we're gonna plug in the things that we know. So we have the equation for VL, so we can replace that. And <laughs> we have the equation for IC, so we can replace that one. So VS is a known value, 24, and then minus CR DVC DT minus L DI, and then that's the same as C, I C. So here we have again that equation for I C. So the derivative of derivative of I C D T gives me <laughs> sorry. Um the derivative of this. So what happens there when you take the derivative of this? A derivative of a derivative. Anybody remember? It's what? It's double, so you square it. 
So you have a second, you call it a second order derivative. And so we plug that into that DICDT. I'm just gonna, I like writing RC instead of CR. So I'm just swapping those. And then DBC, DT. So this is now turned into a second order differential equation. And so we now need to solve it using techniques for math of solving a differential, a second order differential equation. So reordering this, I can bring out the second derivative to the first position and divide all of that by LC. And kind of take it over to the other side so I get a positive second order. And this gives me RC divided by LC. And then I take the constants over to the other side or I leave them on this side. So if you remember putting it in like the standard form for a second order differential equation, Um, I don't know. Does anybody know what you guys called this term over here? Forcing function? I don't know what terms they use now in the math class. When it's not zero, it's homogenous when it's zero. And then when you have a, so I learned it as forcing function. No, doesn't sound familiar. Whatever you want to call it, it's basically when it's not equal to zero. So you actually have a value on that side. So um, it's not a homo homogeneous second order differential equation. So the form for a second order, kind of that generic form looks like this, where you can take the derivative and use the notation of just a prime. And in this case, we have a constant instead of it being at zero. So to solve this, turn off the notifications, sorry. I get a lot of notifications. I don't remember how to turn those off, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so the solution, because I already know what the solution looks like, it's still gonna be of an exponential form. So you're gonna have some constant with an exponential. So depending on your values, so looking at this, if you were to treat this like an, a polynomial and it was equal to zero, if you remember, it kind of ends up looking like the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. So this would be the, the homo, homo, homogeneous, hom, homogeneous, homogeneous solution. You would have x is equal to the minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Mm -hmm. So depending on what that b squared minus 4ac ends up being, um, I don't know what you call it. Um, I can't talk today. 
uh, the people within characteristic roots. That's what I was looking for. So the characteristic roots will either say it's imaginary, it's real, it's complex. So it helps determine what characteristic this equation will have. So we're going to use that and we're going to use a cheat sheet to solve for this. And so we end up knowing that the roots of this are going to be some alpha form, plus or minus alpha squared minus omega naught squared. So these are going to be the forms of all of the characteristic roots of this. So depending on these values will help us to know now, is it going to be under damped? Is it going to be critically damped? And we'll now know how does that response look like in between the initial value and the final value? So now we're getting into more complicated circuits and this is how you're going to solve for them. And knowing that it's already an RLC, we know it's going to be of this form that's an exponential. And for this case, alpha is going to be an RTH over 2L. And omega naught squared is going to be 1 over LC. which can be rewritten as a square root of one over LC. And this is called a series RLC. For parallel RLC, we have our alpha is going to be one over two RTHC. And omega naught is going to be the same, square root of one over LC. So omega naught kind of stays the same. Yes. Uh, look at like this d squared minus four AC to determine whether or not it's going to be like over the critically down for the Yeah, so that would be like what is the value of B in comparison to 4AC, correct? So that's the same thing as this alpha and omega. So what we're going to do is actually do the comparison between alpha and omega naught, and that's going to tell us, are we overdamped, critically damped, or underdamped? And that's where alpha and omega naught comparison is just the same thing as saying B squared compared to 4AC. And then that will help us know what form is it looking like. And so we can actually use this table because it's already been solved for us and we don't have to rederive it every time. What we need to do is be able to say, am I a series connection of RLC or am I parallel connection of RLC? And then I can use these equations. And then we're gonna do the same method we did before was finding the values for that equation. Yes. The second one, blue one, this one to this one? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me go here. Okay, so I left the VS on that left side. So it's VS is equal to, and then this is RC, and I just brought everything else over to the right side. Yes? Okay, then I divided everything by LC. And then I just rearranged it on the next line. So the D squared was first, and then the DVC DT was next, and then the VC over LC. Okay. And then I had a question in the back I saw. Did you still have a question? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. 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 Yes.
Yep. So C1 in this case is that VS over LC. Okay. Would you also have to figure out the particular solution to at least figure out the general? Um, yes. Okay. Yep. And we'll get to that. We'll do that more through examples. So yes, thank you. That's the word I was looking for. You need the particular solution. There it is. <laughs> I was like, I can't remember the name of it. So we, I called it the forcing function and then, but the particular solution is what you guys are using. So I'm seeing some head nods, yes. So yes, you're gonna have to find the particular solution. Um, but then we'll look at techniques to actually make that even simpler. So this is the long way of doing it. You have to drive it once to understand where the equations are coming from. And then from there, we're gonna look at, now I can identify this as either a parallel or series connections. And then I can use the formula that we already drove, derived, derived, derived. Okay, derived. All right. Um, any questions up to now? Okay. So that's the derivation. And now we want to look at kind of, okay. So this is what I was saying as far as now, yes, before we looked at the initial and final, and then we just plugged it into the general form equation. And so we can find those same values, like where am I initially starting? Where am I ending up? But now because we have a more complicated circuit, we need to know what's going on in between those. So we're gonna have either underdamped where you have an oscillation. So it's gonna oscillate. And that will be if your alpha is less than omega naught, you're gonna get an oscillation. You're gonna have critically damped when they're equal to each other, where it looks more like that single exponential. So that's the one that's gonna look just like our normal exponential looked before. So that's when you have those values equal. And then overdamped is the condition when alpha is greater than omega naught. And then that's gonna not quite reach up to where the final value is for a longer time, or it's gonna dis discharge slower than you expect it to discharge. That makes sense? So those are the three different forms that the graphs are gonna take. Yeah, uh huh. It seems like more real, 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 So you won't, you won't really know until you actually plug the values in. So you need to know, you know, what is my value for inductor capacitance? Because this circuit itself could, could create any of those forms, depending on the values that you that you have. So um, I had a student ask me this a while ago when I was skiing years back, and a really fun analogy is just looking at strings with masses on them. And you can actually come up with the circuit equivalent to the string, like the mass string system. But you could imagine a like small bit of mass bouncing on a string and how it might trace a uh, function like that through time. One of my favorite examples. Yeah, that's a good one. I might need to find a video on that one. Um, so those that are online, you may not have heard that, but he was saying the example is if you have a spring and a mass on the end of it, and you actually um, have it follow these curves as far as a position, you can see that with underdamped, it's going to go up and down. And so it will oscillate a little bit before it settles. And then for critically damped, it's gonna do it more as like it will come, it will slowly go down to the right one and then it will stay at that one. And then for um, the over damped, it's gonna take a lot longer to come and settle at the right value. So that's, I like that one too. Um, all right, then there's a couple new terms that um, you guys will need to know. So here's a summary of those three responses and how the comparison of alpha to omega naught. So have this handy. This is gonna be the one you're gonna wanna have very handy. 
Um, we have the two terms, damping coefficient and resonant frequency. And so the alpha is called that damping coefficient and the resonant frequency is that omega naught. And so those terms have those names to it. And then you have this new term N or unit, I should say, and it's NEPERS per second. And so this is, this is gonna be a new term for you guys. And so it's used with the parameter alpha. And so NEPERS per second is what you're gonna talk to or talk about. And then omega naught is called an angular frequency and it's measured in radians per second. So the unit of that one is radians per second. So have those handy. Those units are also ones you're gonna have to get familiar with. And then there's this really nice table from your book. And this is gonna be super handy to use. Okay, <laughs> I came back on. Um, all right, so once you're overdamped, you're gonna use this form for the end equation. So one is to identify which form do I have series or parallel? So you have to identify first, what circuit do I have? From there, you're gonna, you're going to um, measure or compare the alpha and omega naught. So one, determine configuration. So you're gonna calculate, I'll calculate <laughs> alpha and omega naught. What's alpha called? What's the name of that one? Yeah, amping coefficient, omega naught. I heard angular frequency, good job. Units for alpha. Neepers per second, so fun. Sounds like somebody's jumping neepers. They're leaping along. Um, omega naught, not units. Radians per second, great. Guys are catching on quick. Okay, then you're gonna compare. So calculate those values, compare alpha to omega naught, and that is gonna determine which one of these you're gonna use. So if you're overdamped, you're gonna use that equation set, critically damped, that equation set, and underdamped, so on. Um, all right, once you use those, then there's a few little tricks that we have to do to get the values in there. So we'll go over those. All right, so let's start with a circuit. Um, okay, first circuit. First off, you have to identify, is this in series or parallel? So if the circuit is closed or open, they're gonna be in series. So hopefully this one is easier to see, like, okay, these are in series to each other. So what you're looking at, let me go back up to this form. Um, the series and parallel is where the L and the C are in relation to each other. So that's what's determining where you are parallel or series. So hopefully you can see here like the C and the L on the parallel form are literally in parallel to each other. It's very easy to see there. Some of the circuits you might question like, what is this? So you'll wanna reduce it down a little bit. Okay, so series, then what do we do after we say it's series? Correct, calculate alpha and omega. Okay, with the series connection, we are gonna use, we're gonna use that alpha is R over LC. 
And then omega naught is the same for both of them. So alpha is, I just add R over 2L. And omega naught is the square root of one over LC. So plugging in those values, RTH you're going to use as the um, the switch will be in the final position because we want to know the exponential is dependent on that final value. Okay, so put the circuit in the final position switch and then determine what your RTH is from that. Does that make sense? So determine RTH using the final final circuit. Do we need to figure out circuit behavior at its initial state at all? Or should we, start we will. Okay. Yeah, we'll go back to that. But those are the values that are going to be. So start, perhaps like it would be a good idea to start with the analyzing it from it being in the final state. And then but you need alpha and omega naught first. Okay. So you want to determine how is it moving? And then here, like you're going to use the initial current yeah, and then you're going to use the initial voltage. voltage and then the final voltage. So you're going to need to know those values, but you first need to know kind of which. So you could find them um, and then figure out which one. I mean, six. they're sixes. I always like to figure out which how am I moving in between? Thank you. Okay, so final one is that it's open. And so RTH when it's open is gonna be what? Twenty ohms, okay. So here alpha will be 20 over two times L is 10 micro. Micro is? Negative six, correct. So that gives a value of one times 10 to the six what units? Oh. Neepers, NP is for Neepers per second. Okay. Omega naught is going to be square root of one over LC with L being the 10 micro. And C is 100 nano. And so what is the N? 10 to the minus. Anybody remember N? Or nano. Uh, the minus. Yeah. So nano is 10 to the minus 9. And so omega naught is 1 times 6. And what's the units for omega naught? Right. Radians per second, correct. All right, so what do you next do? What do you do next? Okay. Compare, correct. So compare, and what do we see here in the comparison? Pretty good. Alpha equals omega naught, and so that means critically damped. I think I was writing things down and this is for omega naught, the denominator where you have like 10 times 10 to the minus six times 100, where do we get that long multiplication from? I miswrote this, sorry. I have two tens in there. <laughs> it's 10, 10 micro from the L and 100 nano from the C. Okay. Yeah, I wrote an extra 10 in there. Sorry. So it should just be 10 micro times 100 nano. Thanks for catching that. Um, okay, so now I'm going to use the critically damped form. So I need to find these values. Okay. 
where B1 is going to be the initial value for the capacitance minus the final value. B2 is going to be 1 over C IC, which will be the initial value for the current. And then the initial value for the my phone almost. Um, and then VC of infinity will be the final value. So now we want to find these values. So circuit for the initial is going to look like what? So I suggest always to redraw the circuit, just leave a blank where the switch is and leave a blank where the elements are and then determine what's happening with them. So looking back up here initially, what's going on with the switch? Okay, so V closed. And then what happens with the capacitor after it's, you assume it's been sitting there for a long time. So that will be an open here. And what happens to the inductor? A short. So this will be your initial circuit. And we need to find the initial current IC and the initial value for VC. So IC will be what? Good. And VC will be what? Okay, so you could identify it's a voltage divider, but if you don't see it's a voltage divider, how else can you solve for that? No voltage, thank you. Okay, so if I go back here, I don't have a ground in here. So where would I put that? Love the bottom always. <laughs> so put the bottom in. Where am I putting my node? Okay, so right here. So that's VC at that node, correct? Do you see that? If not, you can color code these again. If you guys remember back to trying to find one. That's the eraser. Okay. I'll do this. So pink goes all the way up. And then this node would be green. So hopefully you see that that node at the top is VC. And then from there, you can say, what's this current going to be? If I'm to write that current expression for the node voltage. Correct. VC minus 24 over 10. And then the current going down. Okay, so VC minus zero, if you want to write that, over 20. And I only have the two currents, so that's easy to say. Okay, now I can solve these. I can combine the terms for the VC. I take over the 24 over 10. And this will end up being uh, 16 volts when I plug that in. So that gives me my initial value for VC. So I have my initial current, my initial voltage. So now I wanna look at the final value. So final switch, go back up to it. Final position for the switch. It will just be open, so I'm going to just leave that open. For VC, or I mean for the caster, okay. it's still going to be open, and the inductor, okay. short. So what is VC final value here? Correct. It will be zero. 
So with this open, again, there's no current flowing through that. So they're all just dangling wires. There's no connection to the 24 volts except for on one side. So in order to have it be 24 volts, I would have to have a connection back to the other side. of. So it seems like in the examples that either the initial or the final at some point would be zero. Can we assume that to be always the case? I don't think that's no. great. These are easier examples to go through. <laughs> So to start with, yes, we're using these. Okay, so now we can plug these in to the actual equation. So B1 is Vc of zero, which was 16 minus zero. So that's just 16. B2 is gonna be one over C, which was a hundred nano. And I C, of zero with zero plus alpha, which is one times 10 to the six neepers per second um, times VC of zero, which is 16 minus VC of infinity is zero. So this one ends up being 16, 16 times 10 to the six. And now VC of T I just plug those values in. So B1 is 16, B2 is 16 times 10 to the sixth T, E to the minus alpha, which is one times 10 to the sixth uh, T, and then plus VC of infinity, which is zero. So this is our expression. Yes. Are the uh, six exponents in that supposed to be the negative power, negative six? No, they're one times 10 to the six. Okay. I have to look back up. Um, one times 10 to the six was alpha. Yeah. So it is very large. All right, questions about this? All right, you guys ready to try your own? Oh, yes. Uh huh. Oh, yes. I see what you're saying. So if RC are in parallel, that's easy because the A and the B will be the same. Um, with them in series, you're going to have to take them, like move possibly the components so they're right next to each other. And then it's the R back to the other side of B or A to B. Does that make sense? Okay. So when they're in series, they should be able to be combined close by each other. And then it's whatever resistance it sees after that. And then if they're in parallel, the top and the bottom should be the same. So it's whatever's in parallel to them. All right. Okay. You guys ready? Okay. I'd like to introduce Katie. Katie, do you mind standing? Hi. Um, I'm um, PCA with the Obviously, my teacher is very good at So maybe you can. And if you don't mind, Katie, we're gonna just, um, they're gonna break up into small groups. If you don't, if you mind, just kind of walking around, seeing if there's any questions as we go too. So feel free to ask questions, Katie and Sean and myself as we walk around. So the next problem is this one. So go ahead and start trying to work on solving for I see it too. Yes. So when you switch at time equals zero, does it move from one terminal to the second terminal? Yep. So before zero, it's on the right side. And then after zero, it will be on the left. Okay. Thank you. So this is an example where it's not going to be zero. <laughs> Great. Well, I take that back.
Hi, human. Thanks for joining us. Um, if you guys want to work as a group together to solve this this circuit.
that was All right, so what did you guys find, series or parallel? Okay, I think I'm hearing everybody, so series is correct. So you put it in the final position and look at the connections between the L and the C. So yes, you should find that it's in series. All right, what did you do next? Okay, so calculate alpha and omega, correct. And alpha is RTH over 2L, and omega naught is 1 over LC, square root of 1 over LC. All right, so RTH you find from the final position. And so in the final position, um, you have this circuit. Oops. And the switch is closed there. So this is uh, VC and then 20 ohms. So hopefully you see that the connections between these two RTH will just be 20. And so alpha is 20 over two times one, so 10. And what's the units? Getting better, neighbors per second. Um, omega naught is one over one times 10 to the milli, 10 to the, yeah, milli is a 10 to minus three. And what's the units for this one? Correct, radians per second. And we see that alpha equals omega naught, so critically damped. So we're going to use the same equation set. And this is going to determine Vc of t. So for an initial circuit, what do I do with, I'll start with the inductor on the left. What do you do with the inductor? Okay, short the inductor. Where's the switch? Yeah. And the initial. Okay, it's gonna be here. And what do we do with the capacitor? Correct. So, we need to find this initial VC. 
and the initial IC. So what's IC? Correct, no, no actual loop. And so it will always be zero if you have floating. So if you don't have a full loop. And then VC will be the 40 volts. So with no current flow here, that means the voltage across here is zero. And so that wire is connected to the top and at the bottom. So that's why it's equal to 40 volts. So we have 40 volts as the initial zero for IC. And then we need to do the final. What's going on with the inductor? Short again. Where's the switch? Right or left? Left. And what do we do with the capacitor? Right. So BC here is going to be zero. So now I plug in the values. So I have um, B1 is VC zero minus B. C infinity, so 40. B2 is going to be IC where C was 10 milli. And IC of zero is zero. And then alpha is 10. VC of zero is 40. And infinity is zero. So I end up with B2 is. 400. And let's go. So the C of T equals B1, which is 40, plus B2 of T, E to the minus 10T. And that is the voltage across the capacitor. But I wanted to find the current through the capacitance. So how do I find IC of T? Correct. Good job. So we know that IC is equal to C dVC dt. So we have to take the derivative of that, VC of t, what's that gonna be? So I can rewrite this as 40 e to the minus 10 t plus 400 t e to the minus 10 t. So the first one is minus so I bring down the 10, minus 10. Do you guys remember E raised to an exponent? You bring, or exponent T, you bring that exponent value down. So this is going to be uh, 40 times minus 10. Minus 10T. 10 So these two will cancel. Oh, I guess I'll back up a second. Okay. So the first one, e to the minus 10 t, bring down the minus 10. And so it's 40 times minus 10 e to the minus 10 t. For the second one, you have two t's. 
piece. And so you have to use product rule. Thank you. I was like, what's it called? So you have the first and then you take the derivative of the second and then you take the derivative of the first and leave the second. So the first one would be 400 for 400 T. So 400 E to the minus 10 T. And then for the other one is 400 T. And then you bring down the minus 10 T from that or minus 10. So there's the minus 10. So these cancel out and you end up with um, just the minus 4,000. I don't know what that is, but uh, 400 T E to the minus 10 T and then I C is going to be C, which was 10 times 10 to the minus three times this. So this will be in amps. So this is gonna be your value for I C of T. So I had a question that somebody asked that I wanted to go over. And the question was, you know, why do we include L when the initial and final L doesn't really affect? And so what happens to the circuit is that you, when you find an initial value, Not catching any of these. Okay. Let me get it. All right. So initially, we have all these. All right, so initially it sat for a really long time. And charged up to be 40 volts here. But the current was zero. So this is right after it sat for a really long time. But right when you switch the switch, it'd be easier to draw this. <laughs> what happens to that inductor and that capacitance? Because they, they do have an effect right after the switch. So you model right after the switch. a voltage source for a capacitance and a current source for the inductor because they cannot change instantaneously. So your inductor had current and then as you switch it, it has to stay that same current value. Voltage, the voltage has to stay the same. So those are the characteristics of a capacitor and a, an inductor. So here, this is gonna be 40 volts. And we actually found the current in that one was zero. So that one does look like an open. I guess I can open it up. Might be easier to see. But that 40 volts is, is applied across that 
And over time, it does have a shift in the current through the inductor. So it, I don't know, maybe this example wasn't an easy one to see this, but um, it does affect that inductance affects it. If it wasn't there, this would either be a short or an, if there wasn't any component there, but if it was just a wire there, your value across the 20 ohms is gonna change. It can change instantaneously. So I could have zero volts and then in one quick second, I can put on 40 volts and then immediately it will have 40 volts across the resistance, right? But the inductor and the capacitance don't work that way. They cannot change the voltage immediately or the current immediately. And so they have a different effect and that effect is a little bit more over time. And so that, that's where um, it still uses that effect to determine in that alpha value. Does that make sense? No, not at all. <laughs> I'm like, did I totally confuse you more? I've, I've got a kind of nice mechanical analogy to inductors. They are kind of like the neutral lines, um, the way the magnetic fields form. And if you look at like how magnetic field changes, uh, a lot of the analogies to momentum would relate. So if I have a wind turbine and I want to start to try to rotate it and spin it, the second I start moving it, it's going to resistance because it has all this weight. And then after a while, I'll be able to start bringing up the speed. But the moment that I first apply power or force to the wind turbine, it's going to be momentary. It's going to stay stationary. And that's kind of like what I think of. That's a good one. So yeah, you can't like over time if you keep putting that same amount of pressure, the wind turbine will start to turn, but it takes it a moment before it will start to turn. And so initially it's like it just can't go from on to off unless it's electric. <laughs> um, but you know, manually powered, it's going to take that minute. And so that's the same thing with an inductor. It takes it a minute before it will start to actually move. And then it will go to the end value of what it will be at the end. Um, but initially it just takes that moment. So that's what's happening. So we can model that with that inductor can be a current source there. And then for faster, a voltage. Um, so I guess my point here was that he was wondering, um, the question came up like, well, why do we have L still in that alpha calculation when it doesn't really affect the circuit, it starts out zero current through it and it ends with zero current through it. It's that initial time right as that switch moves because it has an effect right then. Does that make more sense? Yeah. Okay. So that's the only point I wanted to bring out with that one. Um, on Thursday, you have do your homework for RL and RC. RC so make sure to attempt those. Um, you'll have a quiz Friday. It will be open again all day from 8 a.m. till midnight. So you can do it the quiz at any time during that time. All right, see you guys on Wednesday. Oh, and labs do start today. So make sure to go to lab if you have lab today. Yeah, next time, post the cheat sheet, the tables, and the big book. Uh -huh. um, if you can post that, yeah, as like an easy way to access that, I think. And I wanted to ask, um, uh, is the lab like all set up for you to go and like, you know, it's like, there's like 30 to Yeah, there should be. Um, as far as for the students to buy or, Yeah, like what, what sort of resources do I get to like provide? Maybe I should talk to them. Um, yeah, so they, they should be buying their own kits. Um, and then they'll have to derive kind of their equation and then buy their parts that they get the values for our, our LLC. So, so they may have already their values, you know, but if not, they'll need to kind of buy them by LLCs. So like some, some students may have red. Yeah, and so if they don't.